Okay, uh, let's make a start. Um, good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon to where we are in the world. Uh, my name is Professor Rick Merkert. I'm a professor in transport and supply chain management and also deputy director of the Institute of Transport and Logistics Studies at the University of Business of, of Sydney Business School. I'm going to be your MC, the moderator of uh, tonight's uh, session. Um, which is uh, our third uh, Threadball webinar. Um, we have used these uh, webinars, um, so we had two of them already over the last couple of weeks, to really bridge um, um, you know, that period that uh, spans from, from our fantastic conference that we had last year here in Sydney to uh, the next uh, conference, which will be held in South Africa, in Cape Town, in, in late September next year to uh, continue the conversation that we had and, and show some learnings, some policy recommendations, but also some um, research recommendations that we established um, as a result of uh, the wonderful workshops that we had here in Sydney. And I'm really pleased to have uh, the workshop shares of uh, three of those uh, workshops uh, with me uh, here today. Um, and I will introduce uh, all three of them a little later. Um, so in terms of uh, just a few housekeeping sort of things, um, uh, we will have um, the Q&A uh, option uh, or the chat open um, at all times. And please uh, uh, start populating that Q&A um, chat with questions. We will have uh, uh, 20 minutes of presentations for each and every um, workshop, uh, which will be followed by 15 minutes of uh, questions and answers for each and every workshop. So we will allow you to unmute yourself um, um, uh, and, and have a proper discussion in the Q&A section of each workshop. But uh, until then, we would like to ask you to, to uh, remain uh, muted and, and, and put your questions in into the chat um, if uh, possible at all. A recording of the webinar will be available uh, post event, as will be any slides that the risk presenters are happy to make available. And I think there, there, will, there should be available. And, and, and of course, there will be the workshop reports that will be published in, in Retrack very, very shortly. Uh, so let's uh, get uh, right straight uh, into uh, uh, the workshops. And, and we start with uh, workshop one, um, which will be presented um, uh, and was called sort of chaired by, by uh, Professor John Preston and, and, and Anders Prestren from Lund University. But uh, Professor John Preston joins us from the UK. Um, he's a professor within the transportation group and part of the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Science at the University of Southampton. He is an ever present, he, he's an ever present at uh, third book conferences. Um, his research in transport co covers demand and capacity modeling, regulatory studies, economic appraisal and land use and environment interactions. His initial work concentrated on rail and bus, but subsequent work has covered all the major modes of transport. He has published over 400 journal articles, book chapters, conference and working papers. And uh, without any further ado, I would like to hand over the panel to John um, to tell us uh, more about what he has been doing in, in together with Anders and, and quite a few uh, participants in, in this workshop one and uh, tell us about the key findings and perhaps also a little bit about what uh, he recommended the panel or the wider audience uh, uh, in Sydney um, as to what we should do over the next two years and, and how to prepare for, for Cape Town and then what might likely be sort of issues that we will be discussing in, in Cape Town next year. John, over to you, and you have 20 minutes. Thank you, Rico, and timely greetings to wherever you are in the world. I will now do the normal embarrassments of trying to share my screen. I may be a few moments. Hopefully that's come up this and now it's good. put it into slideshow and now it is into uh slideshow so uh -huh. what i want what i want to talk to you about over the next uh 20 minutes is the workshop report on workshop number one 
which was uh, entitled Regulatory Regimes, National and Comparative Regulation of Public Transport. However, I'm going to update the uh, presentation that I made a, a year or so ago, or we made a year or so ago, back in the Grace Hotel in Sydney, uh, and with some reflections one year on. And those reflections are mainly mine, and they haven't been through uh, the, the workshop process. Um, now, I'd like to start off by saying, as you can see from the picture of the participants there, we are a relatively small group, uh, 14 members, only actually five resource papers. That gave us a lot of time for discussion, which turned out, I think, to be a good thing. The other thing I'd like to say is that we were a mixture of academics, uh, people from transport authorities, regulators, and at least one operator. And for various reasons, that mix is important. So some of the some of the ideas that we explored in this workshop had actually been drawn up by Didier van der Velde, and therefore some of the way we ran the workshop was influenced by some of Didier's previous work, and in particular his transport policy paper in 1999. But the aims that we put on the front, these were a bit more from me. So traditionally, there's been this binary divide between largely publicly owned and controlled public transport systems, the classic regulation model, and privately owned and controlled systems deregulation. And indeed, it was maybe deregulation that acted as a spur to the whole Threadbow Conference series. Uh, but the series also co uh, coincided with renewed interest, I mean, this interest has existed in the UK, at least in Victorian times, in a third way of limited competition, as it might be called, through competitive tendering that was authority-led. Now, the broad aim of this workshop was, I thought, to consider a fourth way in which there's greater operator involvement in limited competition models with a focus on the implications for authorities and regulators. We didn't really get very far to identifying a fourth way in the workshop, but one year of reflection, and I think we might have got a little bit further, and I'll explain that later later on. So we had five broad three themes, um, and I'll tr come back to these at the end and try and conclude on each point, but we were looking at what does it take to have a well-performing uh, public transport authority? Who in turn will set up good contracting, tendered or not, because it doesn't necessarily have to be done by the transport authority. Thirdly, how can the governance of urban public transport be improved through the engagement of key stakeholders in a coordinating transport authority or possibly public transport authority? Fourthly, where a trend for more public sector involvement redevelops, and that's been a theme of the last two, maybe three uh, thread bows, uh, what arrangements could be proposed to ensure that public entities competently and efficiently provide transport services? And fifthly, what does it take to make public entities competitive with the private sector in terms of efficiency and performance. And we were, meant, we were hoping to look at this not just for unimodal sectors, I not just bus and rail, but also uh, multimodal bus, rail, and the competition for private transport, and in both metropolitan and non-metropolitan contexts. So in the event, we had a relatively limited number of uh, case studies um, and what we did is we discussed those case studies and then related them to um, this framework of organizational structure in public transport, which comes from DDA's 1999 transport policy paper. Uh, so the split between authority initiative and markets is an uh, initiative. So the authority initiative examples from our resource papers were drawn particularly uh, from uh, Portugal and in the greater Lisbon area, a body TML, English translation, uh, Lisbon Metropolitan Transport was set up 
which was to cover 18 authorities in the greater Lisbon area who would delegate their responsibilities to public transport to this body. In the event, only 15 of the 18 bodies did so, um, and tellingly, Lisbon City itself still retains its uh, uh, direct control of public transport. So uh, public transport in Lisbon is under uh, uh, direct public management. But in the the, uh, 15 authorities in in what we might call outer Lisbon, the, uh, the public transport system has been let out in four contracts, two of which had been let at the time of the conference uh, last September, a further two have been uh, let subsequently, I understand. Somebody from Portugal may may correct me there. Um, On the right-hand side of the diagram, we have the market initiatives, the uh, where the government role is more for authority, authorizations rather than uh, uh, concessions. So in terms of open entry, Essentially, the South African minibus market is characterised by like that. So is long distance rail in Europe. So is, uh, uh, well, well, to an extent, local bus in Great Britain outside London. Uh, whereas regulated authorisations included uh, the great uh, the rail system in Great Britain, uh, the bus system in South Africa both dominated by private companies and the rail system uh, or what remains of the rail system in South Africa dominated by uh, pub- public companies. There's been some further competition in Europe in long distance rail, particularly in Spain, although that's probably more under the authority initiative model rather than pure open access with a, um, a third entry hydro in uh, November, 2022. Um, However, certainly with respect to the UK, and I guess this is true elsewhere, uh, some of the reforms that were proposed in the UK have stalled somewhat due to a combination of factors post-COVID recovery, if we can say post-COVID, cost of living crisis, political instability in the UK, which nearly peaked circa a year ago. Um, And one of the other problems there, certainly for... uh, where you rely on commercial uh, bus provision is you start getting this problem uh, of the the em- empty core that uh, uh, the, an extensive commercial network can be always undermined by uh, a less extensive uh, commercial network. I think we see some features of that in the UK. The other thing that we looked at, uh, a model we looked at was uh regulatory uh cycles uh, including the work of andre dementiaf at uh, uh, uh threadbow um so the conventional regulate cycle we can see the outer circle buses in the uh, in great britain outside london would be ex- an example start off at the bottom at private unregulated uh uh monopoly start being regulated and moving uh, uh, into uh, public ownership. And then there is some form of uh, deregulation, introducing competition in the market. Uh, but that that then uh, uh, leads to uh, re-agglomeration and we're back to private unregulated monopolies. In the case studies we looked at, we started looking at some examples of where you may get some movement from regulated public monopoly to some competition, long distance rail in Europe. Uh, um, or you uh, go for competition for the market, as in the Lisbon TML uh, model, i.e. outer Lisbon uh, we might have negotiated contracts, which possibly might be a feature of the public service contracts in uh, uh, rail in Great Britain. Uh, we might have enhanced quality partnerships moving from unregulated uh, uh, monopolies to more regulated monopolies. Again, in the Great Britain bus market. Uh, 
or we may have franchising as in the combined mayor authorities in Great Britain. So one of the features is the interest in some of the movements in the inner circle of the re uh, regulatory circle, which we may return to uh, in Cape Town uh, next year. So one of the other contributions we made uh, in the workshop, or would you like to think we made in the workshop, was thinking about what needs to be done uh, within the transport and particularly the public transport market and and then thinking about who who sh who should do this so we use the traditional sto matrix strategic tactical operational the original version from didier's paper is in the top right of the slide here uh the words in black are words that didier used in his paper and then we could see uh either wording changes or things that we we suggest should be added that uh, could enhance uh, this this framework. And Didier had particularly made a distinction between software and hardware, and we we suggested that there may also be an additional column about organisation, uh, so organiware. So what are the regulatory and ownership models that you go for? Do you have a broad transport authority or a specialist uh, public transport authority or agency? On the tactical side of things, what are your delivery methods in-house v negotiated contract v competitive tendering? Of course, if you go competitive tendering, decisions about whether it's gross or net, contract length, flexibility, the role of incentives, et cetera. Those were some of the things that we thought would need to be added. Um, also, uh, greater awareness of the socioeconomic role of transport, um, not just the, the financial, perhaps return to that again, the uh, wider environmental uh, and social uh, goals. Um importance of getting information to the public but also uh, crowdsourcing information from the public which can be provide important uh, inf uh, information and there's a move towards electric vehicles particularly for road-based public transport refueling scheduling will be uh, uh, quite important uh, uh, and and so on and then the the discussion would revolve around who is best placed to make the the decisions in each cell of this matrix, with an assumption towards the top of the matrix that it would be authority led. Towards the bottom of the matrix, it would be operator led. But it's particularly in these tactical issues, who should make the decisions, and how can you encourage various forms of joint decision making um so the recommendations that came out of the workshop following our discussions um and our discussions based um and a number of examples so obviously we discussed the case of tml in lisbon we discussed transport for new south wales for obvious reasons also, uh, TFL in London and LTA in Singapore were looked at quite a bit. In terms of regulators, we considered IPAS in New South Wales, AMT and IMT in Portugal. For some reasons, there are two regulators in Portugal, ORR in Great Britain. But the the agreed workshop recommendations, so this is uh, def this definitely came from the workshop, a good uh Transport authority should have a clear vision and be experienced, or at least have the uh, ability to ac acquire experience. It should be well resourced and consistent, should avoid silo mentalities and have good corporate memory and be flexible in the face of disruption. Secondly, some regulatory activities could be undertaken by an independent agency. This is... Uh, 
And then there needs to be consideration of regulation of the regulators themselves through the use of audit office and KPIs and the like. There should be stakeholder involvement at the strategic planning and the tactical contract design stages. And this should include authorities, operators and citizens and associations thereof. And this idea of the importance of co-creation, I'll come back to that. There are potential benefits of controlled in the uh, uh, market uh, competition, yardstick competition, and various forms of mixed regime. However, there's also a fifth point, there needs to be trust between politicians, uh, transport authority office, officers and operators through clear mandates, common interests, and appropriate investments of time. We thought there was a scope for a, a sense of excellence in public transport regulation, documentation of good and bad practices, and Threadbow might be a vehicle for that. And then our research recommendations, the clarification of distinctions between tendering and franchising and their efficacy, that's perhaps an old uh, request. Extensions of taxonomies of competition to other contexts. So one of our papers, based on competition in long distance rail and to an extent coach markets in Europe developed an interesting taxonomy which could be extended to uh, competition uh, for the market type models. The importance to look at the impacts of infrastructure pr provision and access charging on outcomes. So that's clearly importance in rail, maybe become importance in uh, uh, electric-based uh, road uh, uh, public transport. The need for the assessment of the relative performance of transport authorities and more specialist public transport authorities with and without uh, the oversight of independent regulators. We'd like to try and determine the optimal allocation of these strategic tactical operational cells in the matrix I previously showed you between public authorities, operators, and perhaps other parties and evolution over time. Consider We wanted to consider the STO links to inputs, uh, processes, outputs, outcomes, and impacts. Old logic mapping coming in there. Assessing the levels of trust engendered by different models, uh, competitive tendering v negotiated contracts. Consider the relationships between the levels of regulation and disruption and the impacts on innovation. And lastly, develop and apply the theory of public value to public transport. Now, the theory of public value uh, was thrown in by Anders Rettstrand towards the end of the workshop. Uh, so this is associated with Mark H. Moore. Some of you will be more familiar with it, I guess, than I. But one of my tasks was to uh, read his, his seminal textbook uh, and think a little bit about why, the, how this might be relevant to the kind of things we discuss at Threadbow. So the the basic idea is this strategic triangle. So. I guess if we were looking at a regulatory regime uh, for public transport, uh, the, there's three things that we need to look at. Does it deliver public value? Does it have uh, political and lead, legal support? Is it operationally and administratively uh, feasible? Now, pr normally the, the issue is trying to measure the public value uh, uh, of a... Um, a public good but of course in transport and, and particularly public transport we've got a long tradition of measuring that using cost benefit analysis now there may be arguments about whether that is the appropriate uh, uh, way to measure this value but this idea of public value as an al analogy to shareholder value for private uh, uh, enterprise could be very powerful um so here are about some of my tentative conclusions. So these are a bit more my personal conclusions. I'm now diverging from the workshop script. I think this is my re uh, penultimate slide, Rico, and I'm over a bit. Um, 
first of all about the specification of the optimal uh, authority it's likely to be highly context specific and here strange reference perhaps shouldn't have put it in vulnerable to the moon underwater syndrome so the moon underwater was a short essay written about by george orwell and it was about what are the features that make a great london pub and he lists all the features and then he concludes at the end that no such pub exists in london and i wonder whether you could you could kind of do something similar uh uh by replacing pubs with transport authorities around the world and the second point the strategic aspects of uh, contracting uh, probably a fairly clearly the domain of the public sector but the uh, tactical and operational aspects could be undertaken by third parties or indeed by operators and the co-production of services informed by public value models could provide a fourth way so the mark h more uh, uh textbook that i refer to if i was being critical from a very narrow perspective it didn't have any public transport examples but it possibly could because we could think about designing and delivering a public transport networks and post covid public transport networks as an exercise in co-production that involves four co's co-commissioning co-design co-delivery and co-assessment within all that to the fourth point they will still need independent regulation and probably need fringe competition to keep public entities efficient and within uh, for public entities there's still lots of work to think about how they may be organized they don't need to be organized in the classic uh, structure of the nationalized industries of post second world war britain um and they they could don't have to be uh 100% publicly owned they could include uh, mixed models so the, hopefully there's loads of ideas to think about there uh, the, this is the uh, text taken from the website of what will be the follow-on workshop, which uh, Didier will be taking the helm of, um, which will, but you can see mapping competition and ownership in land passenger transport in the 21st century, the regulatory uh, cycle revisited. From the title, you'll immediately be able to see how that echoes this workshop. Um but uh, I clearly won't read out the text text here. You, that, that's available on the Threadbow website. So apologies, Rico, for overrunning uh, a bit, but hopefully that was useful. Uh, that's not a problem, John. Uh, in fact, it was only, at least uh, according to my clock, uh, a couple of minutes. So that's fine. That's, uh, that's good. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, very informative summary of what you discussed uh, in, in your workshop. Um, could you perhaps go back to your previous slide? Um, because I would like to kick off proceedings with, in terms of the Q and A, with, with a quick question. So you discussed, uh, you know, a lot about um, uh, co-production and sort of sort of hybrid models, as I would like to call them. Um, and you also discussed um, uh, essentially regulating the regulator. Um, so it's quite a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of government, or perhaps even independent bodies but still public bodies involvement. Um, at the other end of the extreme, you would have um, sort of a lesser fair market, right? Just private operators. Uh, um, and if we go the full cycle, have you discussed that as well? What, what would happen and what were the benefits perhaps of that model or the disadvantages of having a pure sort of private operator run model? Is that something you discussed in your workshop too? Um, yeah, so the pure private, I mean, Essentially, uh, by default, the South African urban public transport market is f falling back to that that position, and that there are there are clear clear issues with uh, uh, assuming the quality uh, uh, of supply and also full network coverage under such uh, such models um, and. 
the I mean, still notionally the UK, the Great Britain bus market outside London is, is deregulated uh, and open. Um, there's been some fairly serious contraction of the market, particularly in the concessionary markets post COVID, uh, which has meant that the uh, fine the financials of this commercial system. Uh, are shaky and leads to what I think is an empty core problem with the just keep getting a successive shrinkage of the core commercial network until it until it virtually disappears without some forms of intervention and there have there have been some forms of intervention um uh, in terms of uh, grants during covid and then support for uh, uh lower lower fa lower fa lower fare systems um but i don't think that neither of those approaches um will be uh are likely to lead to long term long term eff uh, efficiencies yeah and i guess it's also a question as to what function you are looking at i mean it's just a pure provision of the transport bit that's obviously fairly easily uh you know contracted out but then the planning and coordination at the say city or state level is, is i guess where the state probably comes in the public uh well of course in in reality there is still lots of contracting out of those activities to consultancy reports etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. what what i'm thinking well, I'm not an I'm not an expert in this area, and there are there are I'm sure people on the call far more expert than I. But there's the traditional way that we've designed and delivered public transport systems is not going to be tenable in a post-COVID environment, and we need to think about smarter ways. First of all, of designing the public transport networks that we want, and then of 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 delivering them. That probably can't be done entirely by authorities. And it can't be done entirely by operators, and it ne there needs to be some kind of co-production, and there needs uh, which needs to also include uh, the citizens' voice. Um, and I think there may be, yeah, you know, there may be interesting experiments around the world that we could look at. Um, yeah, the ch the two uh, Channel Islands of Jersey and Guernsey had an interesting contracted out bus system. Uh, where the the tenders were actually organised were, were originally won by somebody called HCT Hackney Community Transport. However, they hit financial difficulties in uh, mid twenty twenty two, and they were bought out by. Does anybody know Tower Transit? Huh. Uh, so, <laughs> my. my I'm looking forward to a paper about the bus systems of Jersey and Guernsey at the next uh, at the next Threadbow conference. I might even write it myself. You never know. <laughs> yeah, good pitch to yeah to our transit. A really interesting detail which I wasn't aware of. Um, are there questions from the floor? I can see there's. Uh, let me see. Um, just need to open this. Um, so John Nelson is asking the idea of a center of excellence in public transport regulation sounds useful. Who would you want to have around the table to get things going? Well, that that's a that's a good question, John, which I could probably throw back to you. It's, uh, I mean, I, I thought maybe start starting off with the. Uh, I mean, I think pe people involved in Threadbow would be a good starting point. I mean, clearly there's a lot of, uh, you know, Volvo of uh, finance centres of excellence in various aspects of bus research around the world, and it would be foolhardy uh, to ignore that uh, uh, as well. Um, but you know, that maybe we, maybe we should start a, set up a little working group, perhaps with Threadbow, and then look at, uh, you know, how we might. Uh, Build build on that and uh, uh, bring other bodies in. I mean, obviously there are also you know the international organisations like UIPT who'd probably want to be involved in some some way. But I think you'd first of all really need to say, well, what do you want to achieve from this centre of excellence? And uh, 
I mean, to some extent, there's just a lot of uh, codification of the volume and voluminous information. There's a Threadbow conferences and other uh, organizations have collected. Um, and so I, I'm kind of thinking of it as a rather sort of scholarly activity rather than uh, an activity of political advocacy. Uh, um, um, but that might that that may be a, a rather innocent view. No, great response, and I, I sort of took it that way that you were looking at it more from a scholarly perspective. Um, and uh, I, I concur that Fratbo would be obviously a perfect home for something like this, a good starting point. Um, other questions from the floor. I see that we have quite a few. And delegates from Asia. Um, are there any models uh, out there that you would like to bring out any questions that are perhaps uh, specific to your context? Talk about quite a bit about Europe. I know uh, one of the uh, the webinar last week uh one of i think the first set of workshop talked about participative planning in japan so that would be interesting to see how that would work and actually i jotted down some of the phrases from last uh last week's work uh webinar that uh yeah they were all about this co-production sort of co-commissioning idea the things like inclusive institutional design digital co-production Public private people collaborations. They they were each of those phrases were from different the three different workshop reports last last week. So I think there is some I think there's something in there's something there. There's a desire to do this, but to do it well. I don't know a lot about this topic, but I do know to do it well, it's fiendishly difficult. Uh yes. and um you know, and uh, you know, sometimes no consultation turns out to be better than bad consultation. Uh, I think we've probably all can think of cases uh, of that. And, uh, and I know a co-production is more than consultation uh, before somebody bites my head off it as well. Yeah. But they, yeah, they just shows the challenges of the uh, 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 the challenges of doing this right. Yeah. So there are no questions in the chat at the moment. Can I perhaps take liberty and ask you one more? And we haven't prepared. Yes, go on, go on. So, it's a um, so you talked about regulation, and I'm really, you know, always keen on keying your words on independent regulators. And there uh, was a notion where you said, look, those independent regulators need KPIs, and perhaps they need to re regulate it as well. To yeah. to what extent is there a danger that you do overdo this process to then have something which is essentially not so much independent anymore? Is there a danger there, or is this? Well, just... Yeah, well, but I think you also do have to stress test. First of all, the independence of the regulator. Hmm. So, uh, in the UK context, maybe the water industry, uh, the independence of the regulator there is increasingly becoming uh, uh, under question, and uh, uh, it's quite common that once leaving the regulatory body, you get a, an attractive position in a water company, etc. Um, so, yeah, I mean, clearly to over regulation, and then you haven't got an independent regulator, and yeah, you know, you're back to you're back to you're back to square one. So clearly, that it that is, uh, you know, it's a delicate game of checks and and checks and balances. Um, but we, I think we can see in the UK that, and again, I'm not a huge expert in this area, but some aspects of our independent regulatory system have not worked, have not worked very, very well. Um, and there probably is some evidence of regulatory capture uh, by the regulated firms of the regulator. I think the water industry could be put as a case in point. Roger's yeah. nodding, so I, have, I haven't upset him on that one. I've got a feeling I may have upset him on one or two other things, but not on that I one. Think, I think particularly regulatory capture is a good example of where you need to put a few checks in there to make sure that this 
uh, authority is indeed independent if, as much as it can be. And so that's that's a really good example. Um, any sort of final burning questions before we continue to workshop two? If that is not the case, then uh, let's continue to the next workshop. And in fact, it was not, I mean, I would just said workshop two uh, in our webinar uh, this evening, but at the Fredbull conference in Sydney, it was in fact workshop six. And um, we have uh, Professor Maria Attard with us um, tonight, who is going to present on the key findings um, of this workshop. And uh, um, Maria is Head of Geography and Director of the Institute for Climate Change and Sustainable Development at the University of Malta. A wonderful place. And I hope one day we will come and visit you with the Fedbo Conference. Um, and um, she's the co-editor in chief of research in transportation business and management, associate editor of case studies on transport policy and sits on the editorial board of the Journal of Transport Geography and many other journals in the transport field. Between 2002 and 2008, she was a consultant to Malta's government and helped develop the first white paper on transport policy in 2004, implemented the 2006 Valletta strategy, including park and ride, pedestrian and road passing in 2007. She also supported the planning for the 2011 public transport reform and she sits on the steering committee of the WCTR and is the cluster co-chair for Nectar. And uh, without any further ado, uh, thank you so much, uh, Maria, for joining us um, today. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rico. Um, let's start the presentation. Okay, so um, I was... It, it was my first attendance uh, to the Treadbow Conference in Sydney last year, and uh, I was uh, in charge of the workshop six, which looked at uh, um, micromobility movement in urban transport. And I had the help of uh, Camilla Palpontin, um, who helped as rapporteur um, for the for the session. Um, so in terms of background, um, it's important to state that um, Treadbow 17 was the first time that uh, um, a workshop dedicated to micromobility um, happened. Um, uh, this was, in fact, a direct output of the Treadbow 16 conference, which in, in which this idea of modal integration was first discussed. Um, but of course, over the last decades, we've seen the fast deployment of uh, um, um, e-scooters, e-bicycles, um, complementing to a certain extent and also challenging the existing bicycle sharing schemes that are changing quite slowly and or quite fast in some cases, um, urban transport um, in many cities. And, and of course, we have widespread availability of these systems now. Um, there is varied effects on, on traditional public transport, but there is also varying levels of performance and impact. So we'll see this um, um, throughout also this presentation. Um, so micromobility has the potential to support public transport service also because uh, as we know, um, public transport service sometimes has gaps um, in, in, in provision. So that could be something that micromobility services um, but it also could be argued that um, micromobility erodes the demand for public transport. Um, uh, and this has, of course, put the spotlight on micromobility for um, some of its um, strengths, but also weaknesses. Um, the idea that, of course, the two sectors, you've got public transport on one hand, which is a long term commitment um, uh, uh, from governments and, and, and cities. Um, through infrastructure, service levels, agreements, as we've heard also from John, is quite complex and is quite heavy mm. in terms of service provision. Um, but on the other hand, we have micromobility, which operates um, in many places in a um, institutional void. Um, and, and it's a private and very open um, system. 
Um, so which service models and which government structures could best link these new forms of, 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 of uh, um, features of, of micromobility operations is still very much unclear and is still very much being tested. Um, and this was, I guess, the key to the, the research questions of the workshop, which looked at which benefits the cities accrue from micromobility operations. Um, what are the main incentives for the use of micromobility? modes. Um, we looked at the role of governments and regulators, talking about regulation earlier, and I think this is also a very interesting um, perspective um, here. Um, what are the potential threats, if any, to public transport systems, because this is quite critical also within the context of the discussions in Treadbo. And of course, what are the future? What is the future of micromobility? And th this is quite well, it's quite relevant also because of the fast nature of how change is going since since Sydney last year, for example, and we'll, I'll show you examples of that. So in the workshop, um, we had 11 participants um, um, uh, and we had eight academics, uh, we had um, government representative, private sector representative, uh, we had five countries represented in, in the um, in the workshop um, uh, participants, but also in the um, in the presentations. Um, we wanted to start by looking at the definition of, of micromobility, because this is also quite um, open still. And we used the ITF um, report, 2020 report, um, to look at the types of, of micromobility that we would discuss or we could potentially include. So going from traditional bicycle to e-bikes, e, e, e um, scooters to mono, um, uh, mono wheel um, uh, um, um, uh, transporters to, to scooters, um, um, to also delivery, small delivery or cargo bikes um, included in here. Um, this variety, of course, is a major challenge um, because modes and their design are continuously evolving. Um, I think by Sydney last year, we were discussing the fifth generation of e-scooter models, um, both in terms of speed and torque. Um, and that, of course, is, is um, extremely difficult to, to manage this fast pace also because there is generally a big difference between the, the speed at which um, markets and, and private operators work uh, or technology develops and, and the speed at which regulators um, work and, and then regulate. And this, of course, poses a number of, of challenges. Um, in terms of, of regulation, for example, the, the number of vehicles or the speeds and the spaces. Um, of course, it was also noted that in various cities, demand for micromobility fluctuates, and this fluctuation is um, reflected in, in days or weeks, in months and seasons. And of course, if you look at tourist places, like, for example, Malta, um, this could be linked to demand changes that also reflect um, other um, events, um, apart from, of course, education or, or, or leisure, um, travel, and so on. And so it became evident during the early stages of the discussion that demand for micromobility stems from a shift from public transport walking and the use of taxi services, especially for short trips. Um, that's some of the earlier literature. And this, of course, could have significant implications for um, transport services planning um, across um, various various geographies. We had a number of papers that were presented during the, the conference. Um, the workshop, um, as you can see, was split over three days. We, we mixed um, um, papers and discussions and we, we um, clustered them into um, mobility use and uh, um, uh, the issues of um, public transport and micromobility. Um, and then, of course, a discussion on, on the future of micromobility as well, the questions for the workshop. In terms of the use of micromobility, using some of the, or focusing more on the examples that were brought up in the workshop, um, we looked at um, the presentations from Norway and Australia, 
uh, for e-scooters and then Seoul and the Netherlands for public transport or sort of public bicycles. And in Norway, we had quite an extensive discussion in terms of uh, investigating the effects of regulation. Um, also because Norway adopted quite a liberal approach um, uh, in, in, in the first instance when uh, um, the uh, e-scooters arrived. And so provided sort of a set of natural experiments where data could be collected and number of conclusions could be drawn up for market regulation. And in the case of Norway for Oslo and Drammen, pricing did not seem to be a major driver. Um, so the introduction of new or cheaper operators did not affect the demand of other operators. Um, availability and fleet size does have an, an, a significant impact on competition and markets. And so there is some conclusion from the authors that the fleet size has a major, is a major factor. So if your fleet size is small, then your operation is inefficient and therefore an efficient market should focus more on the few and larger operators um, for it to be sustainable. Um, but of course, the proposed means of encouraging few and larger operators can be done through some form of market entry requirements or tendering or licensing, um, fleet capping or, or removal of the fleet capping and so on. Um, in conclusion, what we found with the study in Norway was that given the flexible and data rich operations of e-scooter services, market based and dynamic regulation is, is indeed possible and, and certainly an opportunity um, for the future of the services. Um, the case study from Townsville in Northern Queensland then looked at e-scooters in the context of um, tourists um, um, and how they um, use the service, um, what they replace. So in the case of, of Townsville, 27% um, uh, replaced car and ride hailing trips. Um, however, of course, and this is similar to other research, majority of e-scooter trips replace walking with 61%, which is very high. Um, in Seoul, the public shared bicycle scheme use rose during the pandemic, um, probably because of the effect of the declining public transport use. However, the disruption caused by the global um, pandemic um, should be taken as an opportunity uh, to foster traffic behavior behavior change. Um, and, and, and some of the conclusions point towards the provision of infrastructure, education, um, integration with public transport as, as a way of um, maintaining that, uh, that use. And in the case of the free floating bicycle sharing scheme in The Hague in the Netherlands, um, the, the use of, of the service was focusing on um, uh, one peak period of service. Of course, this differs from most other studies where there are two peaks observed. Um, the study was very much data-driven. So using um, pattern analysis, um, showing the bicycle relocation um, to hourly clustering patterns. And then of course, the, the, the benefits of um, ridership and in vehicle idle times as they increase and decrease respectively. If, of course, one had to sort of use these models uh, more efficiently, which, which some of these operators in actual fact um, do quite efficiently in some cities. Um, then we look at the impact with public transport. And in another paper um, presented from Norway, we see the interaction between e-scooters and public transport. And whilst the initial review of the study looked at the US and found that e-scooters increase as well as decrease public transport ridership, um, specific cities display low levels of transit before e-scooter use. And that is obviously a very different setting um, than in Europe where transit ridership is higher. Uh, so in, in some of the papers um, in, in early 2020, the three main functions of e-scooters in terms of uh, um, public transport integration is the servicing of underserviced areas by public transport in densely populated areas, the replacing of public transport trips where the generalized cost of public transport is comparatively high, and the covering of the last mile. And these are probably the most um, important um, functions that e-scooter e services could, could complement public transport for. 
Um, and then in Oslo, uh, the earlier studies showed that e-scooters uh, use decreased in combination with public transport and started to an extent also substituting public transport trips. Um, and so in their conclusions, um, they find that um, e-scooters could complement, but as well um, compete with public transport. Um, the setting, of course, of public transport ridership is important. Um, whilst the most of Europe public transport ridership is high, for example, in Malta, it's very low. So um, e-scooters have found a niche in, 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 in you know, taking up um, use in, in particular areas. Um, but we've continued with the discussion, of course, looking at the benefits of micromobility. And uh, in, in, in the discussion, we've, we've looked at the existing research, the experience of a number of cities, and, and, and all the participants, academic, public, and private um, participants agree that overall the benefits are, 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 are you know, quite high. There are a number of benefits that can be accrued. Um, if micromobility is integrated well into the city transport system in terms of travel time savings, mm. reduced cost and health benefits, um, especially for those services which could be described as, as, as active modes. Um, but there are also benefits for governments if they manage to lessen congestion um, through an effective model shift, um, integrating the public transport with, with the micromobility, um, uh, and reducing or shifting from private cars, uh, both in terms of the infrastructure and the urban environment, but also through fiscal and other measures. Um, and of course, mobility operators bring also new business to cities. And this was interesting because it came from some of the public administrators with, within our um, discussion group. They, they, they acknowledged that it was a good sign that operators were coming to the cities. They were bringing new business. And so um, a, a, welcome, a welcome addition to the, to the city. Um, and of course, the, the overall benefits, if you reduce congestion, you reduce uh, air pollution, the health bill Im improves. Um, and of course, uh, communities um, have less cars, some more livable places and increased access and safety if, if properly um, implemented. The question about incentives, of course, we thought of this and we discussed this quite clearly within the presentations, but also in the discussion. And, and here are some lists. Mm. You know, the provision of safe and sympathetic infrastructure remains at the top. It is, it is clearly the most important thing if we are to, to look at um, um, incentive for micromobility use, and we might take this for granted, but it's not in many places. Um, the financial incentives, like the mobility wallets, which are being um, 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 rolled out, this is in the US, um, examples where, of course, you could integrate all the city um, transportation systems um, into one place and then offer incentives for various uses. Um, the upskilling and education, of course, because there is um, this perception that you know, micromobility is fun and easy to use, but not everyone has the skill. You know, cycling for us, for example, in Malta, it always shows as one of the lesser skills amongst the, the population, even the younger ones. And so we need to start also looking at upskilling and education. Um, and then use, of course, the benefits of technology, because today the technology exists. Internet access is relatively easy. Smartphones are um, um, growing in, in, in popula popularity and use. And, and these can be easily integrated to facilitate um, um, the use of micromobility and integration with other services. So the ferry services, the ride hailing services, the park and ride services could all be one solution to facilitate access and mobility. And when it comes to governments, of course, governments have a role. These are some photos which show this was a photo taken in Malta, someone complaining um, on, on Facebook that this is the living proof how bad the situation in Slima is. Slima is a major um, a residential, but also tourist site. I had to move the scooter myself. And that's the man in, in, in the wheelchair. 
um, trying to access the pavement with scooters left on, um, without effective parking regulation. And the second photo, which is a photo I took of Lisbon, talking of Lisbon earlier. Um, and so there is, of course, a role for government. Um, this sort of libertarian approach or cyber libertarian approach to um, transportation services is something which I've always been a bit skeptical. Yes, I know there are people who sort of think that, uh, um, you know, this is the way that things move forward and move fast. Yes. But we always end up with some backlash in the case of the first photo, for example. Um, this landed um, headline news in Malta for um, councils coming out against um, scooters, which of course is not something which um, should happen. Um, so there needs to be enabling legislation to ensure proper enforcement and operation, the regulation of speed and safety, um, and, and equity as, as well. Mm. Um, clear responsibility uh, for the use and the abuse. Uh, some form of licensing, infrastructure, and parking, um, uh, which which is something which um, is still not again um, available in 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 many cities. But once again, there are benefits provided by this sort of technology base uh, to this info to this to these infrastructures. Um, basically, the data mm. requirements and standards. We have opportunities to build a lot of uh, um, data, understand how these operations work. Um, but of course, we need to mm. harness that. Uh, we need the fast changing nature of technology to be better understood and better harnessed by governments. Um, and as I said, the speeds here are very different. And the complementarity with public transport. Um, you know, public transport has scheduled and fixed routes, and so limitations of coverage. The research so far suggests the principal role of micromobility to complement last first link, um, public transport nodes to specific destinations. And, and for tourists, for example, there is an excellent opportunity. We did some studies um, on, on bicycle sharing in, in, in islands in, in Cyprus and Malta, and um, we, you know, we're still seeing this effect that most of the trips are being shifted away from walking um, uh, rather than than car. Hmm? Even though, of course, in in Limassol it's twenty percent car, which is not bad. Um, so the integration needs to be better. It needs to have um, better um, allocation of space. There needs to be more research into also the the possibility of um, location or the opportunity of location and, and uh, um, sharing. And, 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 you know, things like mobility wallets, today the technology is no barrier to this. So it's really a question of coordination and trust, which again, does not happen much in terms of uh, um, um, very stakeholders trusting each other um, with payments and stuff. So governments can act as facilitators, especially when we have these, these fair free public transport um, opportunities being rolled out. And of course, the future. The future lies in supplementing and complementing um, public and private transport services. There needs to be, I think, a better understanding of the life cycle of the vehicles, um, especially with the technology that is really, really going fast um, and, and the business models that are being rolled out in different places. And more research is required to understand the data integration issues and possibly harmonize the technology and services between different cities so that we can you know, also transfer um, um, regulation and policies. Um, there is an issue, of course, of, of, of uh, um, what the future of micromobility is in terms of um, climate change and urban resilience. So what will happen in terms of uh, extreme storm events and extreme weather events, the flooding, the heat waves, the snow, um, and, and of course, micromobility will, will depend on the ability of the service to integrate. Um, and, and the facilitation by government, I think, is where we have a critical role. And here I've put a, a selection of, uh, um, yeah, newspaper articles that show how um, um, micromobility has evolved in the last year. So Queensland is is evidently happy to continue with the service, um, Parisians not, 
London has um, now extended the trials into 2024 because in London they're trialing in a very, very sort of restricted and, and regulated environment. Um, and, and in case of us, this is taken from the times of Malta de Sui, summer is over and e-scooters still have no parking base. Um, uh, um, people still complaining um, and government being um, non-active in this respect. So we need to be more, I think government needs to be more active for sure. And we need probably more support in terms of the research. So just to sort of wrap up the key contributions of the workshop, I think we've identified the benefits. We identified a few incentives which um, um, could be promoted. We have identified the role for government, which, which is important. There may be more research in this respect. The PT complementarity. And of course, more needs to be done about the future of micromobility as the whole thing uh, unfolds, of course. Um, in terms of research, of course, the post-pandemic behavior uncertainty was something that we discussed, of course, last year. Um, the climate change uncertainty, which will quickly replace the post-pandemic behavior uncertainty, given um, the stuff we're seeing happening all around the world with, with um, extreme weather events. The evolving business models and the way they affect societal goals, um, especially when it comes to equity, which I mentioned earlier. Um, the life course effect and the cost of living changes, the health effects of inactive micromobility. It's a whole debate whether micromobility, you know, riding any scooter is, is active mobility in itself. Contracting models, again, convergence of, of, of legislation, which we could learn from and transfer. And of course, the issues of safety through insurance and liability. So the policy recommendation is allow micromobility with effective regulation um, and supplement community services so we can achieve societal goals or sustainable societal goals. Government should be setting enabling regulatory frameworks so that this tech-driven innovation is, is encouraged and managed better in the broader context of transportation systems within cities, set up the education and enforcement structures, enforcement structures that are needed to raise the awareness and encourage beneficial and equitable adoption of micromobility. Um, we need for, a, I think there is a need for appropriate standards. This is something we discussed lengthily in the, in the workshop on vehicles, on GDPR, we need to harmonize maybe operational boundaries for these uh, for these um, vehicles. And of course, encourage healthy and contestable markets to avoid monopolistic practices um, and, and allow for innovation and market dynamics uh, within, within these, these new services. Um, here's a nice picture of all the group that uh, participated in the workshop. We were a, a small but mighty group. Um, with a very lively discussion over the course of the um, uh, um, uh, workshop. And these were the papers, and of course, this and the report will be available in RedTrack. Um, some of the papers are already available in, in, in RedTrack, and um, I'm sure the reports will as well soon. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. Um... Great presentation, and uh, sounds like you had a really interesting workshop there. Um, lots of uh, really thought-provoking discussions. One question, if I can perhaps uh, start off with uh, the Q&A uh, that I had while listening to you was around safety. And uh, so what was the safety discussion that you had? Was that more around safety of perhaps pedestrians, or was it safety of the e-scooter drivers? like? Uh, just uh, last summer, well, your summer, I went to, 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 to Europe and to several European cities and was uh, striving. And I was astounded by the you know, sheer number of e-scooter uh, drivers, young sort of, you know, drivers in particular at night and, you know, purely, well, not well, you know, uh, how do you say? So it was very, particularly at night, you know, these are very quiet sort of vehicles and uh, they can drive really fast and they're everywhere. And so as a driver, you know, I felt like, uh, oh, my God, you know, am I going to hit one of these guys? Because they're, yeah, it's good. You know, yeah. Uh, they're everywhere. And, and so 
Is that, so what's the discussion yeah. around the pedestrians or was it about the drivers themselves? No, it's it's about the drivers and the interaction with the cars. So the, the interaction with the vehicles. So it's it's mm. safety with respect to the infrastructure that is required for them to operate safely. Um, because they do, in fact, at the moment, just you know, go through traffic in most cities. Um, in some cities, they're of course provided infrastructure through segregated, they can use segregated bicycle um, lanes. But again, it's a question of regulating, for example, speed. Um, mm -hmm. And as these, these scooters become faster and, and have a stronger torque, potentially, they're even more um, dangerous if, if they're not regulated well. Of course, there could be this, this um, ring fencing in terms of operational boundaries, for example, where they can operate. Some cities have uh, um, um, instituted operational boundaries, others have not. Um, and so in, in our case, it took, it, 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 it wasn't, so in, 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 in the case of Malta, for example, where the roads are very narrow and the interaction with these scooters is extremely, extremely tight, um, government did not roll out um, regulation, particularly on operational boundaries, when they first started. And so we had these scooters driving down dark tunnels um, where, where by law they shouldn't. Um, but there were no, at least in terms of bicycles, for example, um, but because the law did not include these scooters at first, you know, you could see them going everywhere. Um, so there is a, a safety element for the e-scooter drivers. There is an, an, an insurance element for the car drivers. Um, there is an infrastructure safety element for governments and city um, officials. And it's not only a safety issue when they are driven, also they become an, a safety issue when they are just left on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. um, you can see also examples of, of operational boundaries just outside um, um, uh, dangerous infrastructures like bridges and tunnels. And you see a lump of, of uh, um, um, scooters being dumped as they're, they're, they, you know, they're, they fail to continue driving because they, they stop, of course, they are geofenced geo, geo and say they stop. And you see them sort of dropped on the side of the road. And, and that causes a hazard, whether you are a pedestrian having to go down in the street to avoid them or whether they sort of flow also in the carriageway. And so there are many aspects of safety which we need to probably still research when it comes to, to um, um, micromobility. But these were some of the concerns which um, um, the researchers found, um, but they were also some of the concerns which the public authorities um, were actually um, bringing to the table in the discussion during the Treadball workshop. Yeah, we, you, you mentioned that also that uh, there was quite a lively discussion on, and perhaps also more research needed on whether um, e-scooters um, should be classified as active mobility or not. And, and what was so essentially your take on is something that uh, John Nelson is asking. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the debate is still going on because um, whilst, of course, a, a you know, a, a do, using a bicycle, of course, without the, the, the motor can be active, um, e-scooters, um, you know, just just drive off. I still, be, having tried one, I have. I'm not very good on e-scooter. I'm not very good generally on 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 um, things that are on on one one wheel. Um, so they require quite a lot of strength in terms of um, keeping the balance and keeping on the vehicle itself. So as they might not be considered totally inactive transport modes. There is some activity which, which individuals have to do. Um, the worry here is that if they are taking up quite a lot of the active mobility trips and they're replacing walking, for example, which, which is very common in many cities, as the short trips that people do on foot, now they just you know jump on the um, um, e-scooter and, and get to the destination, that's of course a, a diminishing of activity. Um, but 
to call them completely inactive, I think is wrong. I think there needs to, there, there is some activity which you need to do physically. And in terms of strength, some of them are very heavy as well. So um, um, in terms of strength and in terms of balancing, um, there is an element of activity. Yeah. Okay. No, I think that's again, something that needs to be researched a little further. Yeah. Yeah. Because I guess there's also a view that you know suggests that driving a speedboat is activity is an activity. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I get where you're coming from, and I, I totally agree. I think there's a good uh, there's a good uh, area of doing further research. We have another question here, which is around uh, government uh, subsidies uh, uh, for micro mobility vehicles, and and. Do you think that this is an effective means of encouraging the adoption and 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 if so would would those uh, subsidies then be perhaps uh, helpful in achieving sustainability goals? Okay, yeah. So this is yeah, this is always an area of of um, conflict for many because of course there's the issue of of what do we mean by subsidization? And um, what costs? Um, you're probably hearing the the planes. We have the air show at the moment, so there are a lot of planes flying over the islands. <laughs> Sorry oh, about that. Don't tell me. I want to see them. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so the issue of of subsidization um, can be understood in various ways. I am not one sort of in favor of heavy financial subsidization. But of course, if it's subsidization in the form of infrastructure, I think it is certainly necessary um, for all, all reasons, whether it's safety, whether it is for, for adoption, um, for encouraging adoption and so on. So if you look at subsidization, I think there's, there's you know, the, the definition is quite broad. Um, the discussion of the mobility wallet um, was something which we we discussed here in Malta a, a few years ago when government first uh, suggested the free fare public transport, which which we have in the island, and um, the idea that was was um, discussed at the time between all the operators was that if there was to be a fair subsidization of transportation or mobility options, the funding or the money that goes to make public transport a free service should be extended to all options because public transport has gaps in, in, in its operations. Public transport does not operate at night in most areas in the island. So there are, a number of arguments which would favor a mobility wallet, which would open up opportunities for everyone to use that subsidy, to use whichever service they deem fit. But of course, you don't open it for, for um, you know, um, car use. You, you sort of open it only for um, selected services and make sure that people use um, sustainable means. Um, you could regulate it to a certain extent and say, you know, you could use the mobility wallet only for taxi services, you know, after a certain hour at night or whatever. So there are many, and the technology allows you to do that. So it's not that, you know, there's no technology barrier to ensuring that the wallet, uh, the, the mobility wallet could, could be um, dynamic and could be used in a way which encourages, um, which um, enables people to um, think, Hmm. you know what, today I could use my car less or I could, you know, go for my errands without a car um, because I could get to the city um, using the bus and then within the city go around with an e-scooter and the city center and then, you know, jump on a bus again and come back home and all that will be free. Um, so there is there is an opportunity there which we could seek um, I know it's sort of early stages for some of the mobility wallets that are being launched at the moment. They're all sort of less than five years in, in, in some major cities with some older ones, of course. Um, but it would be interesting to, to see how they perform um, and, and what shifts happen in, 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 in people's mobility 
um, patterns and how we can extend it. The trick here is, of course, to be fast in terms of the, the data, uh, the gathering of the data, fast in terms of the research, and of course, fast in the reaction time of making that mobility wallet dynamic. And um, again, considering that, you know, we government, our government promised parking for e-scooters earlier this year, and now summer is over and there's no parking, it sort of shows the delay at which, mm. you know, governments take, take decisions. And and with with any platform services, really and truly, it's not just with micro mobility, but all these platform services that are driven by technology, we need to up our game in terms of um, um, administration, in, in terms of public administration and 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 governance and and regulations, and we need to be also open to um, you know learning from others, because mm -hmm. it is evident that some are doing it better than others. What led to Paris, you know, falling out of love with with the scooters? Yeah. Whilst in other cities, it is is doing much better. Um, no, that's definitely a fascinating question. I'm sure that will be one that will be discussed also in Cape Town because uh, yes. the sort of uh, jury is still out and uh, and uh, different cities. Different jurisdictions are still trialing, uh, and and they yeah. will continue to trial. And uh, you know, I, I, I thought at some stage, you know, the, these things were sort of, you know, was were gone, and 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 then suddenly you have the new schemes popping up again. And so it's yeah. a bit like what uh, John sort of said to me is that in terms of regulatory cycle, there seems to be a technological cycle here as well. It seems yeah. to be. Um, uh, uh, but getting better and better actually and so maybe at some stage these themes will be so advanced that they will uh, replace uh, or perhaps integrate better with with public transport and 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 uh, take more cars off the road rather than uh, replacing walking which seems to be the case in many jurisdictions as your workshop has found um, yeah. so thank you again maria um uh, unless are, are there perhaps is there perhaps a final question from the audience. I just look forward to more cities coming up to the Cape Town workshop so that we can um, truly discuss what uh, um, different cities are experiencing. So yes. that would be <laughs> no, That would be good. I agree. Totally agree. Um, and uh, so we invite more papers from, from, from around the world, um, uh, experiences, case studies, use cases and, and perhaps even some benchmarking, um, particularly around safety, I would find really interesting to see. But uh, thank you very much, Maria, uh, for this uh, really interesting uh, presentation. And so that leaves us with uh, the third uh, presentation for tonight. And uh, our third presenter doesn't really need much of an introduction, but I will do it anyway. Uh, so we have uh, Professor Roger Wickerman, uh, who is um, Emeritus uh, Professor of European Economics at the University of Kent, where he has been a member of the academic staff since 1977. Um, that's quite a long time. Um, and uh, so clearly has been around uh, for, for a while and has seen it all. And uh, it's really great to have him uh, with us tonight. Uh, uh, he's also a visiting professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Imperial College where he is chair of the Transport Strategy Center. Roger's research focuses on the relationship between transport, especially infrastructure and economic development, regional development and integration in the European Union. He is particularly known for studies on major infrastructure projects, such as the EU's trans-European networks and high-speed rail. He has also recently worked on issues relating to public-private partnerships in transport. Um, uh, Roger uh, co-shared uh, this, uh, this workshop on sustainable transport systems um, uh, with Julie G from Transport for New South Wales, uh, so he in Sydney. Um, uh, uh, he uh, is going to present to us uh, for the next uh, 20 minutes on, on the uh, key findings, major outcomes and policy and, and research recommendations uh, uh, 
that have uh, come out of um, this workshop and and perhaps also we'll say a few words on on what this all mean means for 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 our next uh, uh, conference um, next year in in um, in Cape Town. So Roger, without any further ado, um, the floor is yours and thank you again for joining us uh, uh, this evening. Thanks, Rico. Let me share my screen if I can find it. There we are. What's um, uh, what, what's interesting about this workshop is that it had one of the longest titles and one of the most sort of impenetrable titles uh, of all of the workshops. It also attracted the largest number of participants from a wide on a wide range of themes, which is actually quite difficult to go into in, in into depth uh, to the extent we have. But it was a call sustainable transport systems designed to meet the needs of both users and residents, which was essentially about taking things beyond the narrow look at either individual modes or, or individual types of of of, uh, uh, of, uh, of regulation. And I think the idea of this was that the tendency to focus on sustainable funding in a lot of uh, this work ignores that broader view of a sustainable transport system that satisfies the needs of users, but also of residents, the people who, if uh, they're going to be taxed, have to recognize this balance between who pays uh, for transport systems. And also the fact that it had been identified in the previous uh, thread, bow that the issue of trust was very important. And um, John mentioned this uh, earlier on, how you get trust between not only operators uh, uh, and policymakers and politicians, but also trust between users, that they are clear that the money that they're spending, either as taxpayers or as users, is being used wisely. Um, and, and that's an interesting uh, concept just at the moment but in the UK where it's thought that the, uh, the, the current government, where at least the prime minister is thinking of um, abandoning large parts uh, of the proposed high-speed rail uh, network linking London with the North. So how you get trust that things will be decided and will continue to fruition is very, very important in that. And that's about a great a need for recognition of behavioral norms that govern individual and social behavior. So the workshop focus, the intended focus was on an optimal and sustainable transport system that embraced all modes rather than just looking at one element. And that involves a series of, of questions, how to provide transport that's relevant to all users' needs how to ensure that such transport is affordable to both users and taxpayers, how to create resilience in transport networks. And that's something that we mustn't forget in terms of the fact that we've seen enormous problems of resilience uh, in response to natural disasters recently. And particularly important and a big focus of, of, of the papers that came in uh, for this workshop was about ensuring accessibility for all groups with particular transport needs. And I'll say a little bit about that um, presently. So we get a great diversity of things, but it was actually about the idea that what we mean by sustainability is actually changing through time. And so where sustainability has meant financial and environmental sustainability, there is also the need to think about social sustainability. Transport networks link people together as well as linking places together. And they link people in terms of maintaining their social standing. And they provide varying degrees um, of obstacle to maintaining that social uh, sustainability. Transport we always have to say, certainly as economists, that transport is a derived demand and so that the range of modes that's necessary to meet individual needs, whether that be by public or private transport, whether it's using micro mobility um, things, that provides interrelated and complex challenges in terms of making sure 
that those individual needs which themselves are changing through time. We've already mentioned the fact that um, post-COVID, uh, things have been changing. The, the drive towards net zero is also causing changes in the way that people perceive their, if you like, their entitlement to transport and their expectations from transport. We also had some discussion about service reliability. A service reliability is often taken in terms of whether the operator can maintain a reliable service. But what are user expectations and satisfaction in relation to that? And how can they be managed more effectively when your flight is cancelled, when your train is cancelled, um, uh, 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 and so on, or when you expect there to be um, uh, a, a bicycle available for you to rent when you arrive at a particular station and there are none there. So there's a range of expectations that's important. We had quite a number of papers that looked at the issue of accessibility gaps in transport and recognizing that the traditional way that we measure accessibility, which tends to be in a sort of geographic basis, looking at the time that it takes to get from a particular location to another location, may be irrelevant to households and individuals, particularly those who face um, particular res restraints. So a particular emphasis is on that there are enormous variations based on gender, but also on various forms of impairment, whether physical impairment, visual impairment, um, and, 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 and intellectual impairment, and so on, in terms of giving people the ability to access a transport system uh, on an equal basis. And understanding the travel behavior of transport disadvantaged groups is particularly important uh, in terms of that. Thinking in terms of the extent to which sometimes the travel of disadvantaged groups is dealt with by providing special transport for those disadvantaged groups. We heard, for example, in the workshop about um, uh, the, the, the special transport uh, for disabled school children. Is this an effective way of providing integration in society where what we really need is a basis for people who have got various forms of, of, of disability to be able to access the transport alongside able-bodied people so that they're not segregated as a result of the transport system? Within that, of course, how you finance public transport is important. That's important for the provision of the transport, but it's also important in terms of the extent to which it leads to disparities. Is that are disparities more pronounced where you have only private sector provision? Does contracting provide a so sufficient social focus on the needs of particular groups and particularly disadvantaged groups? And that financial sustainability, focusing on equity and some discussions about the difference between equity and equality in this, is not only by looking at geographic areas, but also looking at household individual dimensions. And that affordability for users and taxpayers. Is it right to charge a user um, a fee because of the private benefit? Uh, the total private benefit they receive from the point of transport, if that makes it unaffordable alongside the cost of living crisis that is being faced in many societies at the moment uh, as a result of uh, changing prices, rising energy prices, um, uh, and the, the costs uh, that have been imposed um, as a result, uh, both of um, the, the recent pandemic, but also um, of the effects of uh, wars and conflicts in various areas. Now, can that be addressed effectively by some view of social inclusion? Is social capital a useful concept on this? That's something that we discussed and there's some interesting discussions about the way that social capital has been a Im particularly important part of the development of transport services in Japan particularly with even private rail companies, 
having a particular notion of their need to serve society as well as just areas. But a focus came out of the workshop and looking particularly at rural areas where there are particular problems, looking at the issues involved in aging societies, in areas facing depopulation, and those facing declining services, which requ may require more transport, the closing of local branches of banks and post offices, for example, um, uh, the reduction in the number of small shops in rural areas. Um, those declining services imply a greater need for transport and a greater need for transport amongst people who may not have access to private transport. And, and finally, the issue of resilience. So that looking at disaster response was important. How easy is it to evacuate areas faced by forest fires, flooding, tsunamis and so on by different modes? The importance there of local knowledge, the extent to which local transport providers may well have a better knowledge of how to deal with those issues than a remotely uh, a remote operator um, who has a contract that does not specify precisely how to react in terms uh, of uh, particular emergencies. And I've already mentioned the problems of COVID and climate change. So what came out of this? Well, in terms of research recommendations, the idea that transport planning and provision has to be cast within a broader societal framework, recognize the importance of social capital, affordability, equity, and equity in the provision of mobility for individuals and for society, and how to allocate resources and how to measure and evaluate these concepts. So a much broader view as to how transport fits into a broader range of services. A lot of transport is involved in taking, for example, children to and from school, but that involves an integration with education policy. A lot of transport is involved in taking people to and from work, work but that also then relates as to how work is being organized or reorganized is there going to be more working from home how does that relate to the needs for transport and what is the implication of that for people who need to be in a workplace against those who don't always need to be in a workplace so modeling needs to account for a lot more off-peak and non-work travel Non-work travellers in many societies bounce back much more post-pandemic than has journeys to work. What days of the week are important? So that, you know, instead of having a reduced service on Sundays, you may actually need increased services on Sundays because that's when social interaction takes place in many societies. Is time saving the override and, and the evaluation of those time savings, the overwhelming uh, important issue in the appraisal of transport. How we look at the complexity of trips, the broader definition of trip purposes, and interesting discussions about the extent to which a lot of travel is generated by the need for caregiving. And that caregiving is often given by certain groups in society. So it's much more likely to be undertaken by women than it is by men, for example. It's much more likely to be undertaken in, in, in areas where you have the integration of multi-generational households. Um, and so that those sorts of issues become particularly, uh, particularly important uh, in terms of thinking about how we define the things that we're actually measuring. And that comes particularly to a, back to this issue of measuring accessibility gaps. Looking at, and this is not an exclusive list, age, disability, gender, income, and location. And that is important. And when we're talking about age here, we're not just talking about thinking about trips for older people, people who've been around, as Rico mentioned, a long time, uh, but also for young people to make sure that they have uh, the ability to undertake independent travel in a safe and reliable manner that is acceptable uh, to society. How do we measure and evaluate social inclusion? 
So thinking about how we integrate social goals as well as economic goals, how those may well differ between urban and rural locations and different socioeconomic groups and within urban areas, there may well be areas of strong transport deprivation that is actually preventing people not just from accessing employment, but from accessing interaction with other people. And finally, but very importantly, in this area of building trust, how we identify and incorporate the interests of stakeholders in the planning and decision-making process. So this is not just about having stakeholders as policy makers and transport operators, but how do we actually incorporate uh, the, the desires of individuals? Is there a way that one can incorporate some sort of iterative planning process uh, in, in this that involves everybody so that people feel ownership of the, the transport system that they get? And so for policy, this is about a need for a clearer definition of objectives. What are we trying to achieve? That means more, better data and better evidence on user needs to inform policy and measure outcomes. And that needs to go beyond the usual way that we do these things in a place. How modes contribute to seamless end-to-end -end journeys? A lot of discussion about the first last mile issue. How do we provide rental bikes at metro stations to enable people to complete journeys easily uh, over, over, over short distances? Are those going to be incorporated within the same, um, the mobility wallet type idea that Maria was talking about here, but the same uh, charging system? Uh, is, 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 is a public transport card valid on those modes? Typically not. And how do we incorporate those? How do we get the right balance to achieve social needs and efficiency between competing services and integrating services? Back to some of the issues um, that John was talking about earlier. And can contracts include a wider range of objectives? The point that I made about uh, local operators being good at responding to local needs um, was, was countered uh, uh, in the discussion on, on, on this by an operator saying, oh, well, you can write anything into a contract, but writing a contract that may last over several years may not, of course, be able to incorporate something that arises unexpectedly. Did the contracts that existed um, before COVID identify how public transport would need to change um, during COVID to maintain the range of services that was necessary to enable a key workers um, uh, to, to continue to function. And again, that societal versus economic value in funding, how to achieve equity of outcomes and the impact assessment of investment. And that's important, not just in terms of focusing on individual groups, but it's also very important in terms of the, the, the spatial balance uh, of, of funding. What does uh, perhaps um, uh, unfortunately been referred to as leveling up and which has become a key policy issue in, in the UK, um, where, where, whereas it may well actually turn out to be leveling down rather than leveling up um, in terms of actually achieving outcomes. But how do we allocate funding to achieve that? Is there a way of doing it? How is it best uh, allocated? And that needs us to go back to understand what this social capital is and how we improve societal outcomes, giving efficient transport to people, improving their accessibility, supporting decision-making, enabling choice, and in particular, making clear that we use, we see pricing is important as part of the allocation model too often uh, in discussions of transport, how we use pricing and how that pricing can be differentiated between different groups effectively so as to make sure that people pay not only what the value of the service is, but what they can afford in terms of that. So those were the sort of the main recommendations out of it. And that takes forward, I think, a number of things that need to be picked up 
uh, in, in the next red road, because it's about making sure that we understand those issues and they get built into all of the different discussions, whether it's about contracting, whether it's about identifying new, new modes and so on, that they're seen as part of a whole and that we stand back and look at the societal issues that are involved in that. So I think I'll stop at that point, uh, Rico. Excellent, Roger. Uh, some really interesting uh, findings in there. Um, can I perhaps uh, start the uh, Q&A by asking a question, uh, which is around uh, sort of the last thing that you said there, because you, you mentioned quite often that you know, it's not just about efficiency and you know, achieving sustainability goals. It's also about affordability and that you must be careful to not price out certain um, demographics out of public transport. And, and so we here in Australia read a lot about um, you know, fairly high inflation, particularly in the UK. Um, and so I'm just interested from your personal perspective as to whether this is starting to you know, have impacts around affordability of public transport as well, or is that, is that inflation not so much affecting um, public transport fares in the UK as such? Um, surely the, the disposable income will be less of, of many uh, UK resident, uh, residents, and so that way there will be an impact. But um, what about inflation in public transport fares? Is there an effect there too? Yes. Yeah, I, th I think I think it, I think it is important to, to recognise that the way um, that in many cases um, where that where fares are set um, uh, centrally publicly, uh, there's a tending to be a sort of a price index plus formula that's been used, which means that public transport fares do tend to rise um, uh, disproportionately, particularly in particularly in rail. Um, but it also affects particular areas so that, for example, one of the one of the big concerns, I think, now uh, is, is about rural areas where it's becoming um, less easy to provide public transport um, on a, a commercial basis, uh, but where fares have continued to rise and where there possibly has not been sufficient attention devoted to the extent to which the, the, the collapse of public transport in rural areas uh, has disproportionate effects on different groups of society and how that can be addressed. And there are ways of thinking about addressing it. One of the papers um, uh, that, that, that we had in the workshop was about the provision of demand responsive transport for that. But that, again, often raises all sorts of issues because the most effective way of doing demand responsive transport um, is to have an app on your phone. A lot of the people who need demand responsive transport may not have the phone that can take an app on it or feel uncomfortable in using it. So that people who are not used to using that may well find that that, that, that you know, it was all right picking up a telephone and ringing somebody um, uh, to, to, to arrange transport, but where you have to do it on an app it actually seems to be another barrier that is being put in the way, let alone what the cost of the service is. Some community transport services do try and get over that, that, that issue, but that does depend on, 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 on being able to provide a way of, of, of providing that sort of community service, which has been found in some rural areas that, that yes, uh, the community groups are taking over the local pub and are taking over the local shop to provide it. Can they then go on further and provide the, 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 appro the appropriate transport for that? And that affects not just those people who no longer have a local bank or a local post office, if they're not careful, uh, and need public transport to access them, um, are finding it very, very difficult, but also children going to school. And then, of course, you get down to the whole issue about people who have, uh, who have disability um, being able to, 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 to attract those. So I think, I think that's the... That, that's the nexus that, 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 that's important in terms of being able to understand how these things relate together and why transport can't be planned in a vacuum to the extent that it may have been uh, in, in certain areas in the past. And understanding that balance between user pays um, and, and societal needs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good, really interesting. Um, any questions on the floor? Uh, 
And perhaps I may also, because uh, last week I was a bit naughty, I was a presenter last week and, and kept asking questions. Um, you, Maria and John, you have been really very uh, disciplined tonight, so you haven't done that, uh, which, is, which is great. But maybe I open the floor to, to you. Do you have any questions for, for, for Roger? Because I'm, you know, I know that you're both working in this field as well, and so has there been something that you found of interest or any question that popped up? Well, in the case of in the case of it's it's more a comment rather than a question, really. It's I think complementary to what kind of Roger was saying. But in in the micro mobility field, we we do have an opportunity to to probably understand a bit better um the user demands um the the barriers at the moment is of course um competition rules um so operators are not very keen um to open up their data um so it's you see sort of bits and pieces of research coming out but um, um there is no provision as far as i know of operators having to sort of provide um, the big the big data to be able to understand um, in more detail what the needs and and what what are the impacts. I mean, if if we talk about scooters, for example, e-scooters specifically as one particular mode, what are the equity issues with the scooter use? Um, yes, of course, there is access. Um, not only from what sort of Roger said, you need to have an, a smartphone with with uh, internet access and and the the ability for it to work with an app um, to operate them. You need a credit card. Um, uh, you need um, so you need that level of access, and then you need, of course, the ability and the access and so on to to actually use them. But so there are a number of issues which we still need to to disentangle. Um, but we seem to be continuously sort of overrun by you know the next the next sort of development of the of the of the technology, um, and this is something which is, is quite frustrating because we we have the data. This is data which is collected on a daily basis, on a personal basis, um, but we get stuck on GDPR. We get stuck with non non um, uh, uh, disclaimer. Um, uh, um, agreements, non-disclosure agreements with, with operators. Um, so we had to fight when, when we were doing the research with uh, um, Nextbike, um, we had to sign NDAs with, with three, three operators in three different countries, um, two different islands. Um, and we were given portions of the data to research. Now, government has the opportunity, of course, to embed that the data requirement in the regulation and, and understand a bit better the user needs. Um, and not only from the, the perspective of sort of planning for future um, um, services, but also to make sure that these services are not causing uh, distress on others. And so the e-scooters, which are dumped on pavements, which then obstruct people that walk and cannot use these scooters. So they are, are stuck to using pavements. And, and so there is a lot of, of that happening, which we need to sort of overcome in terms of, of using um, um, data more effectively to understand um, user demands, user needs, and, and what measures or regulations um, or, or guidelines or practices we, we need to impose or, or include for operators in, in different cities. And and again, when I, I I sort of bundle this term cities, but again we we have cities with very very different geographies. Uh, remember, I mean we have five meter wide roads just outside my house, um, which can barely take you know a walking pedestrian and a, and a fast moving car. So you know you have a, a a cyclist and and you know you have you have to give way to to see how the two will will interact. Then the bigger cities, if you go to American cities, the wider roads, okay, the faster speeds, the potential of dedicated infrastructure, you know, the whole discussion of slowing down city centers to the 20, uh, 30 um, kilometers per hour. So 
yes, understanding how these activities are working, where there is conflict, um, so um, where there is, um, yeah, areas or zones where these, these services are complementary or conflicting, I think would, would benefit everyone. You, know, you want to respond to that? Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 sure, 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 sure. One of one of the, the concerns that I would have in terms of that is 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 if uh, a clever planner thinks that micro mobility is the answer to all of the sort of the last mile type type problems, that could well be very exclusive in terms of how it affects those people who are not going to feel very comfortable jumping on a uh, an, an e-scooter um, or, or any of the, the, the these these micro modes and and therefore the withdrawal of the sort of service that can provide that last mile be, again starts being so we're going to be very very careful about making sure that you have a wide range of stakeholder interests involved um, in 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 the planning, and I think you know the, the issue the issue with these experiments which has been going on um, in in um, the city where I live. We, we had a we had a, an e scooter experiment, primarily addressed at getting students um, uh, who are unable to walk up hills up the hill from the city centre to the university campus. Um, but the, 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 the you know the, the, the distribution of e-scooters all over the place and them going uh, attempting to be taken outside the the, the geofence boundary that then led to the abandonment of the of, of the service. In, in, yeah, eventually. You said something really interesting there, Roger, and I think it's also sort of related, perhaps to perhaps a uh, you know disabled. Uh, 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 people who also have a need for mobility, and and so those are usually also, um, you know, people that that fall into uh, uh, into the category of being you know hard to reach, and in terms of also you know when it, when it comes to consultation, perhaps of in, influence, and so perhaps uh, this is a question of John Nelson. You know, he asked how, how might the, the needs of the, these sort of hard to reach sort of uh, um, stakeholders, you know. Uh, be identified or incorporated on an ongoing basis in, in terms of public transport planning. Well, I mean, I, 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 I think, I mean, there are there are now increasing numbers of groups that uh, that, that rep, represent um, people of of with different degrees um, of, of 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 access limitation, and um, uh, you know, some of them are are are, are fairly militant, but some of them, you know, are prepared to enter into a, um, a sensible dialogue. And I think it's about recognizing that you know, a transport system has got to serve everybody. And and that comes back to that very important issue. We had a we had an interesting discussion, um, um, uh, based on some work that had been done by Janet Stanley, in terms of providing um, uh, special. Um, busing services sometimes over quite long distances to special schools for people for students with 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 disabilities and there's a big educational issue about whether you provide special facilities rather than integrating them into the mainstream environment but there is in the in 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 terms of the transport system that if they seem to be a segregated group that is ta dealt with specially is that the best way of providing uh, the sort of integration um, that, that's important. Now, I mean, the answer to that question goes way beyond my expertise, but from what I've seen, it certainly is argued very often that integration is the best way of bringing, particularly, for example, um, children with various forms of learning difficulty, um, uh, that, that integrating them is often much better than trying to find a special school and bussing them over very long distances separate from everybody else. And I think that, that that's that's a that that's a sort of issue in the same way, you know, as most um, most buses now uh, in most cities that are, are low floor are accessible to people in wheelchairs. And that's a, again important for providing that level of level of mobility uh, that's important. So I think, yes, those groups have got to be involved and it, it's about making sure that stakeholder groups are cast wider and we understand what the building of social capital is. I think yes. that's a big, big question. And how we measure it is an even bigger question. So Roger, no, that was good. 
Roger, that was going to be my question. You'd mentioned social capital several times and how do you measure it? And how do you think it's different from the notion of public value? Uh, I think I'll pass on that one, John. I'm not quite <laughs> sure how it do. I'm sure that these things are 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 are, are interrelated in that. But the one interesting thing on the social capital thing uh, is that we can learn an awful lot from Japan, where social capital does seem to have been embraced much more than it has um, in um, American. European, Australian societies. And I think, you know, we had a couple of good papers that related to the social capital issue um, uh, from Japan uh, in, in the workshop. And I think that's an important issue to try and identify uh, for the future because it, I mean, it's a nice concept to band around, but it's one of these things that is that is quite difficult to pin down and how we pin it down is I think a big question for for the next, next, um, next set of workshops. Yeah, that is a fantastic segue, Roger. Um, and and <laughs> I really enjoy the discussion. Uh, uh, and, and totally uh, unprompted. No, no, we really, really good because uh, you know we we are doing this again for for obviously also you know continuing the discussion and uh, have a segue into our next Bedford conference, which will be held in Cape Town, South Africa, from Sunday, twenty ninth of September to Thursday, third of October, twenty twenty four, and we will have again the same format. Where we have, in addition to you know, really high um, industry and government speakers, uh, uh, our, our workshops. And so in those workshops, we have uh, done uh, you know fantastic uh, discussions with all stakeholder groups. And 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 uh, and it's not just the workshops; it's also the evenings. And particularly with Cape Town, I'm really looking forward to uh, having um, a glass of wine with all of you and and discuss these uh, these issues over dinner. So and and all sorts of social events. So I really look forward to, to seeing you all in Cape Town and continuing um, the debate there. And, and would really like to thank you for your contributions tonight. That was been, was really a you know, fantastic uh, uh, webinar. And uh, this also concludes the uh, three uh, sort of um, uh, webinar event series that we had in regards to that. Though. And so again, to everyone who has contributed, including Becky, thank you so much for your support also there. Um, for the uh, background and 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 uh, an organization of the three webinars and uh, all the speakers, all the participants, thank you all uh, so much. And I look forward to uh, seeing you in uh, Cape Town in a year's time. Thank you so much and um, see you down there.